already fourth, I think, of our aesthetics research. Tonight's speaker is Edward Cantarian, and Edward teaches uh, philosophy here at the University of Kent, and uh, he really has a very wide uh, research interest within philosophy. He's published and has written and thought about philosophers like um, uh, Frege, uh, Kant, Wittgenstein, and so on. But uh, today he's not going to talk about a philosophy, he's going to talk about a German poet, uh, Friedrich Hölderlin. And um, it's a poet, uh, he's a poet who's been very influential in philosophy, so that's, I think, what makes it interesting uh, for us. So, without further ado, Edward. Thank you very much. I must already contradict you, Hans. Oh. He was a poet, <laughs> a poet and a philosopher. This is the whole point of my talk. So, um, but very, thank you very much for your kind introduction. <laughs> After many years of silence and reflection, in 1781, Immanuel Kant published the Critique of Pure Reason. As Kant ex explained in the second preface, the book announces a Copernican revolution for metaphysics. Instead of explaining our reason and experience as answering to how the world itself is and evolves, we must explain the world of experience as a result of our structure and activity, namely of our reason. This sounds very much in line with Enlightenment optimism. Human reason has world-making powers. But in fact, Kant's revolution was a demolition, precisely of human reason. As Kant wrote in the first preface, this is quote one on the handout, human reason has a peculiar fate. It is burdened by questions prescribed by her, by her own very own nature, which she is unable to ignore, but which, transcending all her powers, she is unable to answer. This radical pessimism, with a tragic, almost unbearable verdict, la is, our reason will be forever condemned to ask a certain type of questions while being too limited to ever answer them. These are the questions of metaphysics, the greatest questions of all. Is there a God? Do we have an immortal soul? Is the world as a whole infinite or finite, etc.? Alas, knowledge about these questions is unattainable. Genuine knowledge must involve intuition and the intellect, according to Kant. Intuition, on the one hand, is the cognitive capacity to have the object of my cognition directly, immediately given to me. To have knowledge about God, the immortal soul, and the world as a whole, my intuition would have to be non-sensory because God, the soul, and the world are not objects of the senses. So my intuition would have to be a priori, a faculty of the pure intellect. It would have to be intellectual intuition. And since it would not rely on the senses, intellectual intuition would be absolutely certain. But humans don't possess this intellectual intuition. Only God does, and maybe angel-like creatures. As Kant already wrote in his dissertation of 17, 1770, De Mundi Sensibilis, quote number two, an intuition of the intellectual domain is not possible for humans, for our intuition is passive and hence, and hence only possible insofar as something affects our senses in contrast to the divine intuition. And as Kant explains in the first critique, our intuition is sensory and split up from our intellect. Neither the senses by themselves nor the intellect by itself can achieve genuine knowledge. Only in combination can the senses and the intellect achieve knowledge. But because our senses give us a limited perspective of things, right, because I, have to, I can only look at an object from one angle, the only knowledge we can have is knowledge of appearances, phenomenal knowledge, knowledge of how things appear to us, not noumenal knowledge, not knowledge of how things are in themselves. Since the pure intellect is not capable by itself of intuition, if the intellect is deprived of sensory input, it constructs futile, fantastic aberrations, 
empty illusions of pure reason, metaphysics in the bad sense of the word. So that's Kant's conclusion. Uh, rationalist metaphysics, which proceeds without paying tribute to the senses, is simply ending up in fantastic uh, aberrations, not finding out any truth whatsoever about the essence of things. The critique of pure reason is thus a work stressing the insurmountable split within human reason. No theory, scientific or metaphysical, will ever give us knowledge of things in themselves. Subject and object will always be separated. Kant's insistence in the limitation and fragmentation of human nature did not stop here. He maintained similar divisions in his practical philosophy and in his theory of judgment, in his aesthetics, as it were. We can only know ourselves as objects of nature, but this means as causally determined objects from a scientific point of view. On the other hand, rational agency requires us to think of ourselves as free agents and also as immortal, for how else can we have moral responsibility for our own actions and aim for moral perfection given the finiteness and the wretchedness of this world? This points to an insurmountable division between our limited physical and psychological constitution and the infinite demands of rationality and morality. In addition, coming to the aesthetics, our scientific take on the universe provides us only with causal laws. Laws about objects considered as mere chunks of matter, irrespective of whether we, they are alive or not, those chunks of, ma um, of matter. But our aesthetic and teleological judgments tell us that there is beauty and purpose in the world. Again, an insurmountable division between what is scientifically knowable and what our reason or nature desires to see in the world. Kant's arguments for the multiple divisions within human nature or reason were found unbearable by the younger generation of German philosophers. The need for a philosophy of unification emerged even before Kant's death at the end of the 18th century. Fichte was among the first to attempt a metaphysical system overcoming Kant's divisions. Like Kant, Fichte did not think that human reason can be unified from a purely theoretical point of view. But Fichte, but Fichte believed that it can be unified in the realm of the practical, of action. In the Foundations of the Science of Knowledge, published in 1794 uh, to 95, this is a crucial year for us, crucial two years for us, <clears throat> He presented the most fundamental principle of, of metaphysics. This principle is I am I, or the ego is the ego. So I'll repeat this quite a few times, this principle. <coughs> From this principle, I is I, Fichte derived in combination with two more principles, literally everything, including nature. We'll skip this. <laughs> but what is now this I is I? This eye's eye is not simply a theoretical proposition expressing a truth. Rather, for Fichte, it is a judgment, and as such, it is an act. Everything starts with an action, judging. Since the essence of the essence of the eye is to be self-conscious, the judges, the eye judges itself to be I, posits itself, as Fichte puts it. Ontologically speaking, this is the most fundamental act, and it is an act of identity and union. As Fichte puts it, the I is at once the agent and the product of the action, what is active and what is produced by the activity. Action and deed are one and the same, and therefore the I am is the expression of a deed-action, Tathandlung in German but also of the uniquely possible deed action. <coughs> but the I is I is also epistemologically the most fundamental act, so not just ontologically in the order of things out there, but also concerning uh, my knowledge, my mind. 
Since the I is at once agent and product of the action, there is no difference between what the I is and what the I recognizes. In I is I, the I is to itself without mediation, and thus without any employment of the senses. But this is just what Kant described as intellectual intuition, non-sensory, immediate, absolute, certain knowledge. And indeed, Fichte describes the fundamental I is I as intellectual intuition, as the act offering the highest evidence. It is immediately evident and therefore neither in need of, need of nor capable of any proof. So Fichte goes here already beyond uh, the quotation number two on the handout, beyond Kant. Since agent and product are identical in the deed action, there is no insurmountable division between subject and object any longer. Remember, this is the big problem in Kant to, to uh, uh, overcome the subject-object division. So there is no such division between subject and object any longer, neither ontologically nor epistemologically. Kant's idea of a thing in itself, an object entirely separated from the subject, is absurd, therefore, according to Fichte, for something can be an object only with respect to a subject. Fichte thinks you cannot conceptualize, even think about something being an object without already presupposing your own thinking about it as an object, and that presupposes a subject. Okay, that's a straightforward logic. <coughs> Hence, there is nothing outside of the I, Fichte says. He, is, he thus rejects Kant's claim that the realm of things in themselves is inaccessible to us. It is accessible to us. I am the, the realm of things in themselves, or the I, rather. <coughs> the I is absolute, with it, everything starts. Historically, one can count this as the first formulation of absolute idealism. But we need to be careful. Subject and object are reconciled only in the absolute I, the ego, the I which does not exist in space and time. In other words, subject and object are reconciled in God. But they are not reconciled in the empirical I, in the I I pointed uh, at before. So the subject and the object are not reconciled in you or in me. Fichte assumes that man's struggle for freedom is precisely this, a progress to reconcile the absolute I with the empirical I. In other words, God with man. But this struggle is a never-ending process, an infinite progress, just as Kant had also assumed and expressed through his postulate of the immortality of the soul, without which you cannot even conceive of yourself as being um, an, a rational moral agent, according to Kant. In taking the self-conscious, self-judging I as the foundation of metaphysics, Fichte overcame Kant's divisions by giving primacy to practical philosophy over theoretical philosophy. But the Kantian Fichtean idea of an infinite progress as a form of overcoming our fragmentations left many of the younger generation unhappy. And we should also not underestimate the promise of ultimate salvation which the French Revolution presented for this young generation. Among the students following Fichte's lectures in Jena in 1794 to 5, there was a young man who was particularly painfully aware of the dilemma of humanity, the tension between the infinite demands of morality and our finiteness. As he explained, this young man, in a letter at the time, humanity's goal is to reach the utmost highest morality. I quote number three. But this goal is impossible in this world because it cannot be reached in time since we can only approach it in infinite progress, faith in an infinite existence is necessary for infinite progress towards the good is the unquestionable demand of our law, moral law. But this infinite existence is impossible without faith in a master of the universe whose will wants the same as what the moral law prescribes to us, and thus the rational faith in God 
and immortality is grounded upon the sacred law in us. This young man, of course, was Friedrich Hölderlin. <coughs> to those interested in classical German literature, Hölderlin is known today as the author of the novel Hyperion, or Hyperion in English. Is that how you pronounce it in English? Maybe. Of monumental odes and elegies of the incomplete play Empedocles of translations from Pindar and Sophocles. To those interested in so-called continental philosophy, he is known through Heidegger's later work, who dev devoted many lectures and essays to Hölderlin's later poetic work. Heidegger wrote around a wrote around thousand pages, I think, uh, on Hölderlin alone. Heidegger attempted to understand Hölderlin from within his own philosophy of being, presenting Hölderlin as a poet's poet, a poet of the darkness of our times, mourning the flight of the gods and offering us some prophetic insights into better times to come. But only with more recent work by German philosophers like Dieter Henrich and Michael Franz have we come to realize that Hölderlin was also a genuine thinker whose ideas were expressed both in his poetic work and in theoretical writings neglected so far. What is more, these philosophical ideas arose in response to the problem of division and unity of human nature posed by Kant and Fichte, offering a unique account of the relation between metaphysics, art, and poetry. I return to Hölderlin's encounter with Fichte in 1794-5 in Jena. Initially, in November 1794, Hölderlin's enthusiasm for Fichte could not have been greater. Hölderlin described Fichte as the soul of Jena, a man of a depth and energy of the mind never encountered before. Hölderlin was obviously very hopeful that such a man could overcome Kant's divisions, fragmentations. But very soon, only in January 1795, in a letter to Hegel, he was uh, very good friends with Hegel, Hölderlin puts his finger on the most critical issue in Fichte's metaphysics, as we have just encountered it. <coughs> as seen, Fichte claimed that the I is absolute, because every object presupposes a subject to begin with. But Fichte does not seem to have considered the reverse, and that the reverse is also necessary, namely, that a subject is inconceivable without a pre-given object. Hölderlin writes, number four, his, absolute, his Fichte's absolute I, Spinoza's substance, contains all reality. It is everything, and beyond it there is nothing. There is then no object for this absolute I, for otherwise not all reality would be in him. But a consciousness without an object is inconceivable. For if I myself am this object, then I am necessarily limited, be it even as existing in time, and hence not absolute. It follows that no consciousness is conceivable in the absolute I, that as an absolute I, I don't have any consciousness, and since I have no consciousness, I am, for myself, nothing. Therefore, the absolute I is nothing or nothingness for me. End of quotation. <coughs> there are several essential aspects to this passage. First of all, the passage serves as a refutation of Fichte's metaphysics based on the absolute I. Second, the passage points to Hölderlin's own metaphysical ideas soon to be developed by himself. So let's look briefly at... Um, as at Hölderlin's refutation of Fichte. The argument can be understood as a reductio ad absurdum of Fichte's metaphysics. The argument contains a slightly implicit premise, so I have to make it explicit. This is the premise. Consciousness is intentional. That means consciousness necessarily requires an object of which I am conscious. Yeah, I can't make sense of saying I have consciousness if I don't mean by that I am conscious of something. I have... Consciousness must always require an object. That's why we philosophers call it intentional. This then implies that I must be distinct from the object of which I am conscious. Yeah? I am, consciousness must be distinct from the thing of which it is conscious. 
The argument can then be rephrased by means, so Hölderlin's argument can be rephrased by means of the following premises. This is uh, point five on the handout. Premise one from Fichte, the absolute is conscious. Premise two, everything that is conscious is conscious of something other than itself. This is implicit. Premise three, the absolute I contains everything there is. And because you can easily see that these three premises are inconsistent with each other, you can therefore um, infer from it, well, either anything you want or, the ne or you negate one of the premises, you reject one of the premises. So one thing I can reject is the very first premise, that the absolute I is, um, <coughs> is conscious. In other words, I shall reject that there is any absolute I. So that's exactly what Hölderlin does. He refutes that there is an absolute I. This argument shows Hölderlin as a faithful reader of Kant's critique of pure reason, especially the transcendental dialectic. The concept of an absolute I, according to Hölderlin reading Kant, is a mere concoction or figment of our pure reason without any knowable reality. Kant had already shown that we cannot obtain any knowledge about God understood as an all-encompassing reality, as an omnitudo realitatis, as uh, Kant puts it in the dialectic. In Kant's view, God is at best an all-encompassing reality. Sorry. In Kant's view, God is at best as an all-encompassing reality, a transcendental idea, not an existing entity. A concept, in other words, which we need in order to make sense of human reason as a whole. So God is at best a regulative con concept. In Hölderlin's view, Fichte had abused the concept of God in a way prohibited by Kant. Second uh, take on, on uh, Hölderlin's argument against Fichte. The passage points to Hölderlin's own metaphysical ideas. It suggests that there must be something prior to the subject, that for the subject, for consciousness to be possible, something else must already be there. In the metaphysical order of things, the subject cannot be the first to come, unlike what Fichte thinks. Is it the case that the object comes first? No. The object cannot be the first to come either, because Fichte was right to claim that an object cannot be conceived without a subject either. So subject and object, while necessarily linked to each other, are not prior to each other. Neither of them is prior to the other. Rather, something else must come prior to subject and object, a third thing, or rather something more primordial, something which makes subject and object possible. Why so? Why can't the subject and the object be co-primordial as a first principle which happens to be something twofold, as it were, a dual principle right at the beginning? There are two answers to this in Hölderlin's early writings. I will call the first argument existentialist and the second uh, argument logical metaphysical. The existentialist answer concerns the place in which Hölderlin locates the subject-object division. Remember, the distinction between the empirical and the non-empirical level, as it was already made by Fichte. Fichte distinguished between the absolute and the empirical I. But Hölderlin doesn't do that. He is, in a sense, much more realistic. His focus is much more on the empirical I, the finite, living, suffering human being. He locates the subject-object division at the level of human existence. The human subject necessarily needs an external object from which it is divided. This is because the human subject is characterized, according to Hölderlin, by two conflicting impulses. First, we have the impulse or the striving for boundless activity, for the obtaining, in theory and practice, of everything whatsoever, every possible object. I was listening yesterday to Queen's I Want It All, the song. So this is the association, boundless activity, I want it all. Second, on the other hand, the second impulse is that the human subject has inscribed into it the very limitation of this boundless activity. 
And this limitation just is what an object is, the resistance that external objects um, <coughs> pose to me, to my boundless activity. For if there were no external object with which our boundless activity would clash, there could not be any consciousness. Con consequently, two tendencies or impulses make up our essence. The tendency to overcome all resistance, Fichte's infinite progress, but also the tendency to limit, to individuate ourselves, caused by the resistance of the external objects. What all this means is that the division between me, the subject, and them, the objects, is necessary for me to be exactly the creature which I am. Therefore, the strife between the two tendencies make us what we are, make up our human dignity. That's Hölderlin's argument. He expresses this insight in a more poetic language in a preliminary version of his novel Hyperion, written at the beginning of 1795, number six. We feel the limits of our own nature and our constrained power rebels impatiently against its fetters. And the spirit longs to return to the unclouded ether. But there is also something in us which willingly bears the fetters. For if the spirit were not bounded by some resistance, we would not feel ourselves and others. But this is death, not to feel oneself. The poverty of finiteness, of finiteness is inseparably united with the abundance of the divinity. It is clear, then, why the subject-object division cannot be metaphysically primordial, unlike for Fichte. It is a mere division at the empirical, contingent, fallen level of human existence and the physical world. There is nothing metaphysically superior about this empirical level. In fact, we need to explain how human existence and the physical world could have emerged at all in the tradition within which Hölderlin operates, I mean the philosophical tradition, this calls for a metaphysical explanation. The existentialist argument is purely negative. It only tells us that the empirical subject-object division cannot provide us with something metaphysically primordial. But what can? Of course, Hölderlin's works are full of references to the divinity, to gods, etc., Indeed, in the passage just quoted, Hölderlin speaks about something superior, divinity, from whose, I quote again, free flight, from whose free flight our spirit has abated and fallen to earth. A clear myth of the fallen, right? But this religious talk might not impress us in our own less religious time. However, Hölderlin also offers us a rational argument as to why there must be something preceding the subject-object division. And this argument I would like to call the logical-metaphysical argument. The, argument. the logical metaphysical argument can be stated generally in the following simple way. To think of two, I must be able to think of one first. Or put otherwise, if there are two things, they must be connected, and that connection is what will provide the unity and make those two things possible. Hence, we have to start with one. That's just a very compressed and very abstract way of, of um, summarizing uh, Hölderlin's argument. Now, we find a more elaborate version of this argument in the short text Being Judgment Modality, or Judgment and, and Being... <coughs> as it's sometimes uh, titled. Hölderin writes first, number page, this is on page four on the handout, last page, the very first sentence. Being, sein, expresses the joining, verbindung, of subject and object. How are we to understand this first sentence, especially the term being? We know since Aristotle that being is predicated in many senses. He, he has a very famous passage on that in the metaphysics. For instance, being can mean identity, like in two is two, two is identical to two, or I is I maybe even. 
but me, being can also mean existence, like in God is or God exists, or it can mean the copula, such as in a judgment, such as Tom is man. Tom is a man. So Tom is a man. So here, this is the, the being, the copula. <clears throat> So we can exclude being here as identity, and we can also actually exclude being as existence. Uh, I don't really have to go into that. What remains is that being must be here understood as the copula. That's how Hölderlin uh, seems to be understanding being. However, the copula is merely a logical term in Aristotle and after Aristotle, while subject and object is an epistem are epistemological and metaphysical terms. In traditional Aristotelian logic, the copula is the connecting element between the subject term, that's the subject term, and the predicate term. Yeah? As everybody <coughs> Okay. So, for instance, in, uh, in Tom is man, Tom is the subject, is is the copula, and a man is the predicate. Without a copula, there could not be any judgment. And we could not distinguish between subject term and predicate term. Hence, the copula is, in a way, the ground of possibility of all judgments, of the connection and distinction between subject and predicate. No copula, no judgment, no subject and predicate. But this is all mere logic. We want to go get on to metaphysics. What Hölderlin does, does now is this. He sublimates the copula, the concept of a copula. This is, he elevates it from the sphere of logic to the sphere of metaphysics. Being is, in a way, in a manner of speaking, an ontological copula. It is that which makes the connection between subject and object possible. And this is also what, it, what this means that being is what makes division and separation between subject and object possible. Okay? Right here, subject and object. Okay? <coughs> so he takes being as it were to be here. That's what makes the connection between them possible to begin with. <clears throat> This is, in fact, exactly what Hölderlin argues in the section on judgment. So again, on page four, this is number two, starting with judgment. He writes, Judgment is, in the highest and strictest sense, the original separation of subject and object most intimately united in an intellectual intuition, the very separation which, make, which first makes object and subject possible, the Urteilung, um, Urteil, he's playing here on the supposed but actually wrong etymology of the, uh, the German word for, for uh, judgment, Urteil, which could be understood as the original, original separation or original partition, but it's actually a wrong etymology, as we now know. It was very fashionable in his time. The concept of division, Teilung, entails already the concept of the reciprocal relation, Beziehung, of object and subject to one another, and the necessary presupposition of the whole, of a whole, namely the judgment, of which object and subject are the parts. End of quote. This means that the judgment must come before being, according to Hölderlin. Okay, uh, you get judgment second, being must come first. Only with judgment do we get to division. Hence, being itself is not divided. Being precedes every division. And this is indeed exactly what Hölderlin writes, uh, again on page 4, in, the, in section 1 now, again, second paragraph. Where subject and object are simply, schlechtin, not just partially united, vereiniget, and hence so united that no division can be undertaken without damaging, verletzen, the essence, wesen, of the thing that is to be separated, 
In such a case, and not otherwise, can we talk of being simpliciter, as with intellectual intuition. Dieter Heinrich, and this is the Dieter Heinrich is the doyen of uh, of German studies of German idealism, a very famous man, uh, partly also translated into English recently. Dieter Heinrich understands this passage as saying that being is undifferentiated, that it is not separated. It is true that being is not separated, I think, rather that it is united. But is Heinrich correct to say that being is not differentiated? Well, in some sense, actually being is differentiated into subject and object, if not in the sense of division, of partition. That's exactly what Hölderlin's text suggests. But in what other sense can subject and object be differentiated if not by division or partition? Admittedly, this is obscure. At this stage, it is helpful to look at the German original. This is on page 3. We have, I will uh, inflict a bit of German on you, the second uh, paragraph, wo Subjekt und Objekt schlechthin vereiniget ist, so dass gar keine Teilung vorgenommen werden kann, ohne das Wesen desjenigen, was getrennt werden soll, zu verletzen, etc. Now, what the focus has to be here on is the verb, the German verb verletzen in Hölderlin's uh, peculiar spelling. Today we have a T here. Verletzen does not literally mean um, to damage, actually. It means to injure or to harm. This indicates that the union between subject and object is a living union. And that's true. To divide up a living organism, it is to injure it, to harm it. Does being, Hölderlin's being, maybe mean here life? As Michael Franz argues, there is evidence for this in Hölderlin's poetic writings, especially in the novel Hyperion, completed early in 1797, so a bit after these uh, theoretical reflections I have um, quoted to you. <coughs> Here are two such passages, number 7 and 8, on the, on the first and second page. What lives is indestructible and remains free even in its most enslaved state, remains one. And if you separate it down to its deepest ground, it remains unharmed. And if you smash it down to its core, it will escape your hands in triumph. I hope you like my translation. It's my, my translation. This is all my translation, by the way. Everything there is my translation. Uh, okay, number eight. Uh, in the union of nature, there is loyalty, and there is loyalty and no deception. So loyalty is no deception in the union of nature. We come apart only to be closely united in godly peace with everything, with ourselves. We die to live. I will be. I won't ask what I will become. To be, to live, this is enough. This is the honor of the gods. And thus all that is alive is equal in the divine world, and there are no masters and servants in it. I'm happy I'm uh, quoting these uh, passages to you and not to my philosophical colleagues. They would be crucifying me, <coughs> considering me a traitor. Okay, so how are we to interpret this? Well, to be is to live. Clearly, being is here tantamount to life, but also... To die is to live. Hence, Hölderlin cannot mean here just the biological life of each of us, rather something more encompassing, something larger. Life with a capital letter, as it were. This life is characterized by, if you look at that, those two passages closely, by freedom, equality and fraternity. And these, of course, were the main slogans, the main terms of the French Revolution. At the same time, this type of life is not just a political life, it's also a life which is characterized by immortality and indestructibility. 
It follows that one could characterize all this as a religious apotheosis of the prospects of salvation offered by the French Revolution. So we have in a way a religious apotheosis of a historical event filtered through the metaphysics of Kant and Fichte. However, it wouldn't be enough to mention only Kant and Fichte here. For as Dieter Henrich has already pointed out in 1966, Hölderlin's terminology of unification and separation mentioned in these quotations has a much older origin. They go back, in fact, to... Can you think who? To, well, maybe not as far, but probably even as far. I, I was more modest. Plato or Henry was more modest. They go back to Plato's doctrine of principles and the reformulation of this doctrine by the Neoplatonists, such, such as Celsus, Numenius, Proclus, Plotinus, and many others. In recent years, these Platonist, Platonist roots of Hölderlin, but also of Hegel and Schelling, have been investigated in great detail by Michael Franz, Jens Halfwassen, Christoph Jame, and many others. These German researchers have also shown that it is futile to try to understand German idealism without the immensely rich theological background in which Hölderlin, Schelling and Hegel were naturally, naturally immersed in their seminary in Tübingen, where they had studied together and had become extremely close friends. But what does all this have to do with art and poetry? you may want to ask for your money back, since I haven't mentioned art and poetry at all so far. But I think that would be premature. Art and poetry enter the stage now in the most dramatic way possible as the culmination of Hölderlin's metaphysics. I have mentioned the two most fundamental human tendencies Hölderlin assumes. The tendency to overcome all resistance, yeah, um, limitless striving, and the tendency to limit oneself. The tendency to overcome all resistance is the tendency to have it all. This is just a platonic principle of union of the monas. There you have it. The tendency, on the other hand, to limit oneself contrasts with this union, this principle of union, and this, on the other hand, is the platonic principle of separation or individuation, called by, by Plato indeterminate duality, auristos duas. There you have it. These two principles, union and separation, are in a continuous strife with each other in human existence. But if things ended here, we would be merely reasserting Kant's fragmentations or hoping for Fichte's hopeless infinite progress. With Kant and Fichte, and against the previous metaphysicians, Hölderlin believed that the ultimate reconciliation is not to be obtained by theory alone. With Kant, against Fichte, Hölderlin believed that ultimate reconciliation is not to be obtained by action or practice either, because he has refuted Fichte's um, pragmatic concept of the absolute I. Against Kant, finally, Hölderlin aimed for real reconciliation, for union and perfection right now. And so he rejected Kant's postulate, postulate of immortality and the other postulates as well. As Hölderlin explained in a letter to Schiller in September 1795, so this is all very young Hölderlin, he is 24 years old or so, the Kantian Fichtean prospect of the union of subject and object in infinite approximation would be just like the approximation of the square to the circle. And um, that would be impossible, at least within the mathematical framework within which uh, Hölderlin was operating. He was not aware of in infinitesimal uh, mathematics. But that does matter for us. By contrast, Hölderlin claims that the actual union of subject and object is possible in an absolute something, you can call it I or whatever, he's a bit flippant about it at this stage, so an absolute something in an aesthetic sense, 
in intellectual intuition. So neither in theory nor in practice can this reconciliation be done or achieved only in, aesthetic, in an aesthetic sense. Hölderlin believes that the endless conflict between the principles of union and separation can be actually put to rest in an aesthetic intellectual intuition. What intellectual intuition gives us is precisely this missing third element, the union of the union and separation. We see that this higher union is just a combination of primordial union and separation. Plato himself at times allowed for this type of combination. For instance, in the Timaeus, in his dialogue Timaeus, where they constitute the world soul in which the human soul partakes and which goes through the stages of union, dissociation, higher unity. Uh, one, two, three, if you want. <clears throat> this triadic scheme was more explicitly developed by the Neoplatonists, especially by Plotinus, according to whom the final stage of the triadic scheme is reached by, and now I quote directly from this fantastic uh, piece by Plotinus called On the Beautiful, that man, that man who becomes godlike and entirely beautiful will be able to see God and beauty itself. Well, here is how Hölderlin introduces beauty in the preface to the penultimate version of his novel Hyperion, quote number nine, coming to an end. The merry union being, in the only sense of the word, this is a reference to Aristotle, is lost to us and we had to lose it if we wanted to aim for it, to obtain it. We tear ourselves away from the peaceful Enkaipan of the world in order to rebuild it through ourselves. To end this eternal strife between ourselves and the world, to bring back the peace of all peace, which is higher than all reason, and unite ourselves with nature in an infinite one, this is the aim of all our striving. But neither our knowledge nor our actions ever reaches in time the point where all strife ends, where all is one. We would not have any inkling of that infinite peace, of that being, in the only sense of the word. We would not aim to unite with nature. We would not think or act. Indeed, nothing would exist. We would be nothing to ourselves were it not for the case that that infinite union, that being, in the only sense of the word, were given, and it is given in beauty. Like the Platonists, and especially Plotinus, Hölderlin also has a triadic scheme which ends in beauty. First, we have union, being, that which is undivided within itself. For Hölderlin, this is life itself, with the capital L. Then we have separation, judgment, which introduces the subject-object distinction. In human existence, union and separation struggle constantly with each other. But neither wins. A third stage is necessary to reconcile this struggle. But this third stage can't be the first stage. It cannot be the original being. For, in Hölderlin's view, our fall from being is irreversible. We can't return to it. Everything we think or do, in theory or practice, will involve a judgment, an act, or an action. But judgment, as we know now, brings in division. And being is undivided, so we cannot, by means of judgment, ever reach being. Hence, no judgment can us, uh, can us reach being. The third stage, therefore, must be something else. Not a judgment, but what he calls an intellectual intuition, an aesthetic intellectual intuition. In aesthetic intellectual intuition, we grasp being again, without returning to it. The third stage of higher union is therefore a new stage, not a return to the first stage. So the schema is not one, two, 
as it went on returning to 1, it's rather 1, 2, and then in 1, 2, in, in 3, we reflect as it were upon or recollect 1, 1 and 2. That's the idea. <coughs> uh, this is Young Schelling, 1 to 1, this schema. This is Young Kraselin. So schematically, we don't have 1 to 1, but 1, 2, and 3, or rather 1, 2, 1 plus 2. Hölderlin describes this stage as the N diapheron eauto. Um, did I write it down? Yes. N, N, this is separated. N diapheron eauto, the one differentiated within itself, which occurs in a fragment by Heraclitus and in Plato's Symposium. It is crucial to understand the structure of this final third stage. In it, we have a repetition of one, here, <coughs> and of two. Two is easy to repeat, since it involves just another act or judgment available right now to me, because I live in, in the realm of, of two, of judgment, of division, of physical world. But one cannot be repeated, strictly speaking, how else can we access it? The answer must be by memory. Hölderlin's intellectual intuition must be a form of memory. What art and poetry does is to reconcile ourselves with ourselves in beauty by repeating what we are now in commemorative relation to our divine origin. Here is the four, finally, a sample of such a poetry, thus both composed and to be read and understood. Hyperion's Song of Fate, also very modestly translated by myself. You wander above in light on soft grounds, merry spirits. Glowing, godly breezes touch you lightly, like the fingers of the artist's sacred strings. Faithless, like the sleeping suckling, breathe the divine ones. Chastely held in gentle bud blooms forever their spirit, and the merry eyes gaze in quiet, eternal clarity. This is number one, being. Now comes number two. But us is given not to rest on any ground. They faint, they fall, the suffering men, Blindly from one hour to the next, like water from cliff to cliff thrown for years down into uncertainty. And what is now stage three? Well, I guess us reading this poem. Thank you. That was a nice ending. Uh, so we have um, we have 30 minutes for, for questions, and afterwards, as usual, we'll go for drinks. So, uh, who wants to get the Q and A started? Yes. Like, I just want to pick up on your, you know, that, that last observation that it is, you know, as you say, us, this our third stage is us reading the poem. Could you just enlarge on that as? <laughs> said everything that can be said, I, I suppose, yes. Uh, so this, well, I mean, in a sense, there is something here very contradictory, isn't it, paradoxical in it, because I have given you a philosophical talk overall about something which, alt which about a process which aims at something which eventually can only be expressed in poetry and art, and not by means of judgments, if judgments mean division and separation. On the other hand, what you could say is the third point is different from the first point. We have made progress, okay? Because in the third point, even so we cannot make a final judgment, we can only, as it were, express our feelings. 
we do this in a very different way from the stage we were at in one. Because at one we couldn't express anything whatsoever anyway. Whereas at three we can we can do that. We can make we can in making this um, if you want unintelligible expressions or non conceptual expressions, because we have gone through two which involves judgment and the conceptual we are further than we were in one. But um, eventually, I take it, there is something performative here about, about uh, Hölderlin's understanding of poetry. So his all metaphysics and his all rational uh, philosophizing about his own poetry uh, is only there to bring us to this last step, to this last stage, and then let us experience it ourselves. Yeah? It's a form of... Uh, Yes, in uh, educated f form of uh, understanding art, I, I take it, or poetry. Mm. I don't know, that's maybe not the best way of putting it. <coughs> yeah, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about, um, particularly when we get to stage two, uh, um, and we have the division, the separation of subject and object, um, if you had any thoughts about how that relates to what Hogan says about punishment and the idea of punishment being an encounter with the contingent and so in a sense it represents the same uh, being confronted precisely with that division whereby you have stepped outside of being into mm. separation and because it seems as though un underpinning this is some idea of <coughs> that striving for union as being essentially some being essentially a kind of uh, a tragic or um, a kind of uh, yeah, kind of tragic characterization of the mm. nature of human striving in general, right? Mm. And so the idea of contingency being a form of punishment. Yes, I, you are referring, I think, to this fragment by him uh, on punishment, which I don't actually haven't studied it very very carefully, so I can't say very much about it. But uh, the idea of uh, uh, judgment. Yes, I mean it sets up sets up tragedy, of course. So uh, he has. I haven't been able to cover all theoretical writings by uh, Hölderlin. He has later stage poetical and philosophical reflections, which are around happening around 17, um, 98, 99, and then 1800. But we are getting close to the time when he lost his senses in 18. From 1802 onwards, <clears throat> and um, and yes, he he has he has he seems to have a really complex theory about how tragedy is precisely this third step, or yeah, is instantiating this this third step. So uh, if we are un we are in a sense punished in the second in the step in the transition from the first to the second step, we are having the punishment, the judgment. Uh, we live our lives uh, half conscious only we don't we don't quite realize we struggle and suffer in our lives we don't quite understand why and are blind about it but exactly that's then what poetry and and uh, art does is to bring in this in this third step some sort of well i can't really say reflection right or judgment itself some sort of of uh, yeah intuition understanding about our very own uh, striving and the, the the origin, the divine origin we we come from, and um, and in fact he believes that this third step, this third stage, is the ultimate goal of human life, of human existence. He thinks that the life of the poet is the destiny of man. The destiny of man is the destiny of poet. He says it actually. So um, it's it's paradoxical that uh, Heidegger who who wrote so much about um, Hölderlin didn't actually look at these texts because they could have, in some sense, help help him a lot. Yeah. But yeah. I wonder, yes. I if you could say, yeah. No, go ahead. As, well, there's a fa fa absolutely fascinating, but I wonder if you could say something about this is a big ask, I'm afraid, his relation to to Hegel. I mean, Hegel in the oh, preface, in the preface to the phenomenology. He too seems to deny the possibility of intellectual intuition. But there may be a difference between aesthetic intellectual intuition mm. and what Hegel means by intellectual intuition. I don't know that. And the other thing yes. is the relation to Nietzsche. Now, we know that Nietzsche read Hölderlin and was rebuked by 
a school teacher at Schultz Fort, if they're not frequenting more healthy poets like Goethe, said you, you shouldn't read Holmes, he's an unhealthy. Read right. Goethe instead. Interesting. But, um, what worries me? Is well, I don't know. I mean, Hegel has to be opposed to intuition. What? Because Hegel has to be opposed to any type of intuition. Be, be it rational or aesthetic. Rational well, perception. because in, what is it? Uh, as I tried to explain at the beginning, intuition is that cognitive act where the object is given in one go. Yeah. And I get it in one go. And that would make his dialectic super, super, superfluous. So for Hegel, everything is articulation anyway. And secondly, this is much closer to a romantic uh, structure where you have this origin yeah, being, which really is there, yeah. okay? And in a sense, we, we remember it, whereas for, for Hegel, if I understand him correctly, the progress in which we are um, enmeshed or involved doesn't lead us back to anything no, at all. It's, 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 it's God as God is right now, and we are constantly progressing but forward. Right? There's a tension between all this escape. I mean, there's a form of escapism, isn't there, in, in all this? I mean, it's the same with Coleridge in England. You know, he's, he too is in, in, in all, to the, all these Neoplatonists. Very interesting parallel with mm -hmm. Coleridge. Interesting. He did nothing but spend his time reading, trying to reconcile, trying to turn Kant into Neo, a Neoplatonist, in fact. But there seems to be a tension between we know Hoverlin was also interested in tragedy because he translates Sophocles and yet the tragic vision which Nietzsche tried to get a grasp of in Birth of Tragedy seems to be completely antithetical to all this Platonizing. You can't reconcile all. There is no, there is no ideal one. There is no return to the, the, the origins in tragedy. It just faces us with reality, as Nietzsche said. These is turning away from reality. Well, uh, I would be careful. So, I think he doesn't want to return. Yeah, at least that's what I try to argue. He doesn't think it's possible to return to this initial golden stage or age. It's rather that we can, we can, we can only remember it, and in remembering mm -hmm. it, we reach a sort of reconciliation. But it's never it. there in the first place. Well, that's. <laughs> that's I mean, if you don't if you don't buy into this premise, there's no point reading all these philosophers. I think up to Nietzsche, I guess. Yeah. Only, well, not even Nietzsche, because he argues against this whole tradition. Yeah. You have to start with analytic philosophy, Frege. <coughs> okay. First, uh, and then Murray. Thanks for a fascinating talk. Um, Thank you. The I just wondered <coughs> if you could talk a little bit more about. I was very interested when you saying about memory at the end. This mm. is memory of divine. Yes. Because it, it strikes me that some sort of modern thinking around subject formation could sit quite well with that. The idea mm. of you know, the subject formed through memory, and partly in response, you know, in response to aesthetic experience. Yes. I don't. I don't know. I mean, he doesn't. He doesn't say very much about it. So I found. I found some passages here and there where it seems what that what he's talking about must be talking about must be this intuition. Otherwise, he would be really, we'd be really back to this escapism. We're really returning to this initial stage, right? But so he's not very clear about what is being remembered? No, no the, about that I think he's clear. It's, it's right. this initial stage, but that's our only access, and it's intuitive anyway. It's not ju judgment. So by the way, this brings us into serious philosophical troubles, because according to a prevalent contemporary philosophical account of memory, memory is propositional. So in other words, it involves sort of judgments, if you want. So a memory which is uh, intuitive in his sense, that would be only, I don't know, memory of maybe of faces or things like that. But not, not, that's not the kind of memory he has in mind. He, he has some sort of platonic understanding of memory, recollection of the of the um, yeah of the initial stage and now if you claim that this is all an illusion yeah where does this leave us anyway then the whole thing seems to collapse but on the other hand we are really struck by this poetry how come yeah thanks uh, Ed, for, for a fascinating talk Thank you. Uh, I mean my question is really about kind of like um, how far you want to kind of 
so to speak, push the extension on the relevance of, of these arguments. So it's, it's very clear how this illuminates a particular philosophical tradition and a particular philosophical drama happening mm -hmm. in the late 1790s. It's very clear how it illuminates our understanding of Hodling's a poetic work, the poetry itself. So all of that I take as kind of a given. The question I'm asking is, okay, how much would you want to take from this to take beyond these debates and offer up as some kind of living, relevant account of art as we have it now, or at least mm -hmm. art beyond the historical moment in which these debates happened? And just to throw in a quick parallel, okay, for the, yes. for the kind of thought or question I'm posing, I mean, famously Arthur Danto has taken lots of Hegelian ideas, right, and kind of rehabilitated them and argued for them in an analytic con uh, context. So it's not a sort of non-starter to think that there can be these kind of surprising um, transplantations from very different contexts, very different philosophical traditions, and for it to kind of at least arguably work. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's the question. Well, I don't know. Um, I suppose um, you, you could make a distinction here. You could say, so he's on, on the one hand, he seems to have some, some kind of uh, theological <clears throat> commitments here, right, to this, um, to this union or unity that we have, we have lost or fallen out of. Mm -hmm. And you could say, mm, we don't really share these theological presuppositions. Can we still make some sense of his reflections? And... I think you could, but you have to at least grant him that the, these ideas are at least meaningful, make sense. So the ideas of God, the ideas of some sort of soul or of immortality must, must at least make sense. Uh, if you don't even allow for that, then his premise, his first premise is just nonsensical. And what Danto does, well, he... He does his own Hegel. I'm, I'm not so. I'm suspicious to this type of reconstructions. Yeah, in fact. Um, well, so, so, so just to pick up on yeah, that, yeah, yeah. just just to have that, that yes, discussion. Yes. So, um, if you're suspicious of that, that kind of um, <coughs> that kind of reconstruction, I presume you would think that, and there's no disparagement, but I, I presume you would think, as it were, the kind of exercise you've, you've taken us through today does have a kind of delimited, it's a delimited project, right? Yes. It's, it's, a, it's about illuminating a, a set of self-understandings within this philosophical and poetic tradition, right. which wouldn't have the ambition to speak to, say, post-Darwinian art. Uh, I, well, I, I, su I suppose that's right. I mean, uh, one of the most famous analytic philosophers, uh, Quine, uh, once said to uh, Peter Strawson in a private conversation when he was asked by Strawson, so what's your favorite poetry? He says, I don't have any. I stopped reading it at the age of 16. It was unsettling me. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's not just an anecdote. I mean, there is another type of human being created right now to which this kind of stuff does not appeal. So we are here at the yeah, I at, might a, at a rift, <laughs> at a rift of ages, I think. But another thing, I couldn't include this. I mean, you could, of course, um, you could, you could really um, make, uh, you could really destroy uh, Helderlin here. You could really take take him apart because and Fichte too. In fact, I don't know about Hegel, but you could say his whole supposed refutation of Fichte is based on a certain understanding of judgment coming down to us from Aristotle, right? Judgment, Thomas Mann, consisting of this copula. And all Helderlin really does is he sublimates, he, he turns into a metaphor, a very simple and rather boring logical observation, right? That in order to have a subject term and a predicate term, you need also the verb to be in its third-person flexion, right? And in a way, that's, that's all he does, right? He, he overblows here a simple logical fact into something that doesn't really, doesn't really fit with, with our logical observations at all. Okay? That's, what, that's what I would say in my, as, as a 
purely analytical philosopher here at this stage, right? He's simply blowing up the subject, the subject predicate distinction and the copula into ontological distinctions to which nothing corresponds at the end of the day. But the trouble is, as I said, is that based on these rather straightforward mistakes for an analytic thinker, yeah, he comes up with this amazing construction whereby his own philosophical construction has some sort of artistic quality. It's not just his poetry which has quality, artistic quality, it's also his, his uh, philosophical constructions. Right. And who am I to come now and yeah, but tear it down? Why should I do it? Then wouldn't the point be, yeah. is this okay? Yeah, right. yeah. Then wouldn't the point be, well, you don't have to buy in yes. to Hodlin's <coughs> philosophical account, <coughs> right, which may have been biographically important to him as a way of, write, you know, as a way of yeah. arriving at the point where he could write his poetry. You still don't have to buy into that as a philosophical or theoretical account, mm. correct account, mm -hmm. of why the poetry is effective. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, in other words, we we you know we can sit here and we can recognise that this poem has considerable faults yes. and artistic qualities, but it give an entirely non hordelinian account of what of what it is for a poem to have. Well, this is too general for me. I mean, um, what would that be anyway, that account that you'd give? I mean, I could simply read this poetry and say, wow, it sounds really be nice, so good. No, 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 what I'm saying is, well, well, I'm well, well, <laughs> no, 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 you have to operate only within the term set, right? By the philosophical stroke, artistic, cultural tradition out of which it emerges. That's what I'm disputing. Well, he's not oh, I wouldn't. That claim. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't I make. I wouldn't make this uh, general claim. I would make it with respect to Helderlin. He's not just any poet who scribbled down some reflections. So that would be the difference. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't simply want to discount him, knowing the philosophical education that he had and which I think can be made some sense of that they had an impact on his poetry that's no, simply too right. you're too quickly brushing no no no, no yes you are. It. What, let me make a quick, quick analogy okay very, very quick okay <clears throat> um, I don't have to uh, I don't have to assent to Rastafarianism to appreciate to what sorry Rastafarianism so another religious okay. doctrine okay okay to appreciate the music of Bob Marley. Yes. Why is that any more true? Well, I don't have to assent to any of these philosophical ideas to appreciate that it has enormous power. Well, but the only thing you can say is that it has enormous power, nothing no, of else. of course not. No, I, can, I, I can then give the kind of account you've given yeah. of, of it as a form of culture which has been powerfully expressed, given powerful expression. But you're using here powerful all the time. That's your only adjective that you have to characterize yeah, it. That's why I said, wow. That's yeah, the only thing okay. you have. Whereas I have here a whole articulated account to make sense of okay, the poetry. What, 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 what critics do is they take the word wow and the word powerful and they give you descriptive elaborations of that term. That's what our critics do. Well, go ahead. Do it. It contains three letters. <coughs> no, no, just, by the way, any, 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 any more about Dan Tell? I mean, he's a, just an aesthetic nihilist. He just thinks that the work of art is what anybody says. Is <coughs> I'm going to interrupt you. I think that's exactly the sort of discussion we want to have over, over a pint of beer. Did you think, did you um, think that I was committing myself to uh, Hölderlin's philosophical position? No, no, I didn't. I didn't take you to doing that. Um, what I was raising the question of was... Um, whether, whether we have to uh, assent, in any sense, to um, the philosophical ideas given embodiment in the poem, <coughs> in order to appreciate the power that they have. Well, and I'm simply I would say there are three alternatives. So you are giving us two alternatives. I, I would just add a third alternative. So your alternatives are... We are just we are taken in by the power of the poem, which presumably we can all experience. We are um, we are assenting, as you put it, right, to the philosophical 
ideas which are um, under under uh, uh, under what is it underpinning thank you underpinning uh, his poetry I would say in addition to that are um, his philosophical framework taken as a whole right leading to this type of poetry whereby my own understanding of this poetry would not be as rich and powerful without understanding this philosophical framework and that's that's this third alternative is formulated in terms of understanding of hermeneutics if you want not of truth not of assent <clears throat> okay can we well, do that? Yeah, absolutely. We, 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 we can actually regard that as a synthesis. Okay, excellent. Poetry. Stage number three. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank you for thank you for your question. Shane. Yeah, I, I was struck by the fact <coughs> that at one point talked about the young Herdelin, and really you have focused on the earlier Herdelin here, haven't you? And I would, would you agree that, that the, the, the tripartite, uh, the, the sort of three part structure that you've offered us, in fact, we don't need to go back to Plotinus, we can go back to Kant. Kant, it's not insignificant, wrote three critiques, and the third critique, the critique of judgment, is in a sense a, an mm. attempt to reconcile the problems produced by the first two critiques. So in a sense, this Herdelin that you've offered us, his concept of aesthetic intellectual intuition is quite close, ultimately, and perhaps even derivable from aesthetic judgment in the third, Kant's third critique. And what we get here is quite a, quite a Kantian uh, Herdelin, but that there is a second Hodel, the later one, um, who is mm. who is who is the, the both the poet and the thinker who has been such a profound or was such a profound influence on twentieth century theories of the, the aesthetic and also the practice of poetry, as, as you yourself know. I mean, you, you, you've spoke, you've spoken uh, at Kent on, on Ceylon. Ceylon is a classic example of a poet who was profoundly influenced by by the later Hodel. And in terms of an aesthetic theory, and this I suppose connects to Murray's point, um, Adorno's aesthetics, <coughs> Adorno's long essay on Hoderlin and Parataxis and the aesthetic theory is deeply indebted to what I would say is perhaps the later Hoderlin. So is, is it right to say that the, 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 the model you've offered us here is really applicable to, if you like, an, an early Hoderlin who is essentially Kantian, and that there is, a, there is another one that we would need to take into consideration who is less Kantian but at the same time not Hegelian, because this, he sticks with, if you like, the aesthetic rather than moving, making the, the, the move that, uh, that Hegel makes towards absolute spirit. Towards okay, spirit. okay. So, well, that's answer. another difficult question. Um, I can't really comment on Adorno's uh, essay on Herdelin, because I read it and I didn't understand it, so I can't assent or dissent from it. Um, but... Um, the term intellectual intuition occurs in uh, these later reflections as well. So we would have to really look very carefully at their place, their, their function. But it's not that he, he thinks now, later on, that there is no such thing as intellectual intuition. In fact, he takes intellectual intuition to be correlated with tragedy. So uh, you have the three forms of... of uh, of a play, and tragedy is the third one, and that's what he correlates intellectual intuition with. So we'd have to look at that. Now, as to uh, Hölderlin's connections with Kant, so the critique of judgment is a critique of judgment, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, whereas he seems to be denying this, he seems to be denying that we are dealing with an aesthetic judgment in intellect. He thinks we're dealing with aesthetic intellectual intuition. And I'm not sure what place there is there in, uh, in, Ka in Kant here, whether that's not quite, quite a contradiction. Uh, the second thing is, so you are actually absolutely right, Hölderlin was under, under um, great influence by, by uh, Kant, by the third critique. He read, read, read it very carefully. It came out as, he read it as it came out immediately. And... Uh, so he was much impressed by it. He definitely took many uh, clues from, from that book. However, as far as I understand the third critique, um, so the account of beauty there is an account of something which emerges in the interaction between the subject and the object. 
in, yeah, between the subject and the object. And he calls it, Kant calls beauty a symbol uh, of morality, right? So in some sense, there is a strong element of, or, or, or contribution from the side of the subject. When I see something beautiful, like, let's say, the, the, the sky, the stars in the sky, in some sense, and I'm experiencing this beauty, I'm not experiencing the quality of what I'm seeing. In some sense, my experience is reflective, right? The beauty that I'm experiencing is actually comes about through my own reflection about the infinite in me and the finiteness out, out there, and that's what, what overwhelms me. And I'm not sure whether Hölderlin would agree with that, because, as you see, he's a Platonist here. Yeah? He believes in this original state in, in, in being. There is nothing like that in, in Kant, is there? Well, I'm not sure, because Is I that? think Kant, Kant <coughs> recognises that it's your feeling about the object. It, it's not just the object, it's your feeling about the object. And he's very subtle in saying that this transcends conceptual formulation quite frequently. Mm -hmm. So that brings him, as Shane said, that brings him closer to her. Okay. I think. Yes. But, I, mean, but I don't know whether it, it would bring Kant closer to Plato and to <laughs> Plato's, uh, to Hedelin's Pla Platonic... Uh, well, origin of the... Of course, what he's primarily concerned with is the claim to objectivity of a critical judgment, isn't it? Yeah. Critical... yeah. Well, we are dealing here with the origin of beauty, of beauty, or what, of what beauty is supposed to be, according to Erdelin, I take it. It's, it's a way of uh, re-experiencing that primordial unity, really. It's our access to it. It's the only access we have to it, in fact. I, I and it's not doesn't have a moral dimension I, I at the end of the day. The count does. The, I mean, it is very obscure, of course. The yeah. critique of judgment, very difficult work. Indeed, yes, of course. He does. He does um, allow for getting away from the conceptual and intellectual, <coughs> and there there would be more of an effect, the, 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 the purely conceptual and intellectualistic approach, and there there would be some affinity with Hölderlin. I think, and perhaps that was why Hölderlin was impressed. Uh, I think Shane was suggesting that. Did you Shane? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, I'm afraid, afraid that we'll have to stop here because I, I've been told that the room has been booked at, uh, for, for 6 p.m. But as you see, Edward, there are more questions. So Edward is going to join us for a drink uh, to the Gulbenkian, and I hope everyone else will, will do too. Thank you for your very useful questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> so let's thank Edward again. For